Well, aloha, y'all. My Houston trip has not quite worn off yet, so I'm still using a little bit of Texan here. So welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This show is sponsored by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum uh, with funding uh, from the Hawaii Energy uh, Institute, uh, Natural Energy Institute, which I work for, so I, I should know that and spin <laughs> it off like really easily. Uh, from HNEI, as we call it. And I'm really pleased to have John Cole. He's one of our staff uh, at HNEI. He's the uh, HNEI Senior Policy Analyst. Uh, previously, uh, John was the Consumer Advocate and was on the Commissioner on the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC. And he looks at stuff like the duck curve. So you may be wondering, what is a duck curve? And that's why the topic for our show today is what is it and what can we do about it? So John, uh, what is the duck curve and what can we do about it? Hi Mitchell, thanks for having me here yeah. today. I'll be glad to talk a little bit about it. Um, what it is, is it's just kind of a graph that shows a load profile, which means the energy being used over the course of a day, a typical day. And um, that, that changes depending on, you know, what's going on with energy and if you can go ahead and show that first slide, I just like, this is actually today's use of energy. The uh, blue line on the larger side on the left is actually a, a load curve, we call it, or how much energy the utility has to make to serve its customers. That's the dark blue line. Um, and the light blue line above that is a net load curve, which means what all of Oahu is using. So the space between those two is what's being produced on rooftops by solar energy and being used by those homes or businesses. And the utility doesn't need to serve that. So the utility line is lower during those hours of the day when solar is producing. And what we mean by duck curve is that um, solar production that's being used at homes or businesses and doesn't have to be provided by the grid kind of pushes down the, what used to be a no, the normal load curve of the utility before a lot of people started putting TV on their home. So it, it changes the load curve to have kind of a downward belly. Right. We call it the belly of the duck during the day when solar is producing energy on the solar panel. Right. What's the problem with that? Um, it's not necessarily a problem, but it, it can become a problem. Um, with a load curve like that, um, there are certain things that affect the system. The system was built a long time ago. It was meant to push energy from the generating units, which were largely oil-fired or coal-fired, you know, in certain places and push it across the transmission line to end users at their homes or businesses. Um, but with people actually producing their own energy, mostly with PV these days, um, it, it kind of changes the dynamics of the grid and it makes it more difficult for the utility to, you know, supply what is being used by people. And by pushing down that load curve, it changes some of the things that the grid has to do. And I'll explain that a little bit. Um, if you want to show the next slide, just for a more quick description on what we're talking about. Um, those different colored lines from the blue at the top to the red at the bottom are a the typical daily load curve for different years. And the red is 2017, and the top one or highest one in the middle is 2013. So that's how a typical daily load profile has changed over the years. Um, like I said, the utility normally, you know, it goes from midnight to, to midnight again, but in the night hours, the load is relatively low, and it used to be, it creep up in the afternoon, and then the peak on the right is in the evening time, typically after the sun goes down, like from 5 to 9 o'clock at night. So when everybody goes home, flashes up the stove and all the other yep. utilities, the computer. Takes showers, take all, showers all that. All so that so stuff, yeah. Hawaii has an evening peak. Some places on the mainland will have afternoon peaks. Yeah. But Hawaii, where, you know, the climate is a little different and you know, most people working go home and they put on their AC and start cooking and doing laundry and all those types of things that use energy We have that evening. Peak. So the last <laughs> line there was 2017, we're now in 2019. So 
So is that belly getting even bigger, or have we kind of slowed it down, or what's the status? It has slowed down a little bit in the last couple of years, and that's yeah. because of some changes to the programs that the utility has for a rooftop TV. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit of that as we okay. go on. But I did want to show one other thing. Those, the, the next slide is kind of the same thing, but the previous one was the whole system. It was actually a, a graph from the Big Island, but it's the same story for Oahu. This general shape. And this looks at just distribution circuit, which means the part that goes from an electric substation to the homes in various areas. So it's just one feeder or one you know, distribution circuit. And the same thing happens on a circuit level. But um, what happens, as you can see on the bottom, because there's so much solar production during the daytime, yeah. people generally aren't home at that time. So their homes aren't using it and it goes back onto the grid. Right. And when there's a, more than that whole circuit where all those homes in that neighborhood are using, it can push back through the substation and out into the, the bigger grid. And that's something the utility isn't used to. They, they have looked at ways to try to you know, handle that and see if their system's OK. But it can cause some problems with voltage and flickering and some other issues at the home level right. and not the whole system itself. But um, one other issue it does cause is that um, there's, there's so much PV on the system, if, if one of their thermal generators trips offline, um, a lot of that PV, because the frequency will dip, will also trip offline, making the situation worse. And that's why um, the utility and the Public Utilities Commission started looking at changing the, the programs for rooftop PV. Um, the original program was net energy metering, where folks could pretty much, you know, size their system to meet all of their energy needs over a course of a year right. and, and get a retail rate credit for that. Um, but there, there were a few instances where it led to some of these issues, and it is only very few times over a year, so there's room on the grid for more PV, but the utility needed some way to be able to see and and control and better manage what's going on. So right. that was some of the reason for the changes in those programs. And I can explain a little bit about that as well. Okay. <clears throat> um, like I said, the original program was just called net energy metering. Um, the commission ended that program, which basically was for a retail rate credit in late 2015, and put in place a couple of other programs. One is called a customer self-supply, where a customer can put solar on their roof, but they can't export any to the grid. So they would have to use everything that's being produced or dump it, basically. Um, so that basically forced people to put less solar on their homes, because, I mean, they're not there a lot during the week, during the day. So <clears throat> they wouldn't overbuild because they can't export to the grid, and they'd right. kind of be wasting the energy and, and the investment to do that. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, another program that was brought up with that was to um, almost the same as net metering, but the the credit that you'd receive for exporting um, energy to the grid was lower than what your retail rate was. So you, you, people wouldn't overbuild their systems, and because they're not, you know, making that type of uh, money back, so they they're more careful about how they size things right. and. The commission put a cap on the amount of that that could go in, and that's been reached. And they've changed that program to something right. else called um, Grid Supply Plus, which is the same. It's, it, they actually lowered the rate of the credit a little bit, but they also are requiring inverters. They have some more advanced inverters now that are capable of controls. So they are requiring in addition to that lower rate, that those systems have these advanced inverters that would give the utility the capability to you know, see what's going on and control some of that PV at the home in certain circumstances, right. which at this time don't happen very often. Like shutting it off so they can't, yeah, they export can't discharge it. it, they can't export and it. It wouldn't right. cause problems under certain grid conditions. Right. Right? Yeah. So now we have battery storage as well. That's a, is that something you're right. going to talk about? Yeah, and there's, there's a third program I wanted to talk about that's in place now called Smart Export, right. where you can have solar on your home, but you can't export to the grid 
during basically the highest solar hours. I think it's from nine or ten in the morning till four in the afternoon. Right. So um, most people who take that program put in storage so that they can store that energy and then use it later in the evening right. or overnight. Um, so that's another way that they've been addressing that duck curve or keeping it getting a lot worse. And um, <clears throat> I, I guess we'll go to the, one more slide. Um, these are the various programs. I, I'm not going to go over those, but I just described them. And if you could just go to the next one. Um, this is showing the number of solar systems that went in per year. And as you can see, the, over the, the last bar is just the year to date, so we'll ignore that one for now. But over the years from 2017 to 18, the increase in the number of systems or megawatt total that has gone in reduced quite a bit from what it had been earlier. Right. I mean, you can see it yeah, rose exponentially for a while, and now it's kind of flattening it's out. It's kind of flattening out a little bit there, yeah. So, yeah, these programs are um, kind of slowing down that duck curve, and yeah. because the incentives were so great for people to put solar in, everybody was jumping on it if they could afford that investment. Right. Because economically, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, it right. was kind of a payoff for that net metering program where you get a retail rate, you know, very short, two to three years. Yeah. Whereas now, if you can't export, you're going to get a smaller system, or if you want to, you get batteries, and the payoff's longer, like in the six to so, ten-year range. Aren't the batteries now, the self-storage, isn't that like the next big thing? Is that where we're evolving to? And would that like help the number of installations go up? Yeah, definitely. It, yeah. it has, um, and mostly that's what's going in now over the last couple of years is, right. is systems with batteries. So they aren't exporting during those high solar times and, and storing the energy for use later in the evening, okay. overnight. Okay. So um, what, can the, what else can the grid be doing about this? I mean, the uh, electric utility that they're not yeah, already doing? Um, well, they... they took a lot of steps as well to, you know, be able to handle the amount of rooftop solar on the grid. Um, one was the way they run their thermal units, their oil-fired generation. Right. Um, because they, they're old units and they have to keep generation online in case there's a trip or something. Sure. So, so that can kind of fill in that gap if something goes wrong. So. What they've been doing is trying to get those units to run at a lower rate. Say, say if a thermal unit can generate 100 megawatts, um, before it could only, the lowest rate it could run at would maybe be 25. So there's still room there. And yeah. they, they've worked really hard to find out ways, even these steam units and old boiler-based generators, yeah, that yeah. Uh, they can get it down the minimal run megawatt to, to even lower. So what that does is it leaves more room on the system for, for renewables. So, I mean, they can, more wind or rooftop solar or utility scale sure. solar can go into that. And it also helps give them the reserve, you know, if they need to move those units up higher, they have more reserve to do that. Right. So that allows them to either turn some units off during those high solar times or you know, just generally be able to have more space on the grid, and the hope is to eventually retire some of those units as yeah. the you know renewable energy and storage, particularly, will help okay. with you know, that type of thing as they go forward. So um, we're coming up to a break very shortly, <laughs> but uh, let me just introduce the topic of electric vehicles. Like, you know, if you can <clears throat> charge them during the day, you can kind of eat up some of that duck curve. Like I have a neighbor uh, over in Ina Haina who bought a uh, electric vehicle and he took great delight in going out watching his meter run backwards and while he's <laughs> charging his car at the same time. Yeah. And so virtually, I mean, in that kind of a situation, if you have a good roof, you got good sun, and you have an electric vehicle and you're home during the day like a retired person who doesn't have to go out and work, then you can be recharging your vehicle and it's like kind of like the most awesome way to do it. Oh, yes. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I'll right. be happy to talk about that some more. Okay, we'll talk about that after the <laughs> break. So we'll be uh, going on a break, but we'll be right back in about one minute's time. Uh, this is uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. I'm Winston Welch, host of Out and About. It's a show that we have every other Monday on Think Tech Live here. We explore a variety of topics that are really interesting. We explore organizations, events, 
and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. We've got some amazing guests on here, like all the shows at ThinkTech. So if you want to catch up on stuff, tune into my show every other Monday and other shows here on ThinkTech Live. It's a great place to learn about stuff, to be informed. And uh, if you have some ideas, come on my show. Let's talk about it. See you later and aloha. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm your host Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World. I'm, I come to you live every second Friday from 3 p.m. And this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health, and uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier, and have fun at the same time. So do join me. I look forward to seeing you. and. Uh, Aloha. Well, we're back from our break. It's Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And I'm here with John Cole from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, who's a senior policy analyst. And we're talking about the duck curve and how we can kill that duck. Yep. Well, John, <laughs> we were talking during the break about electric vehicles. We started off talking about electric vehicles before we went in. So yep. uh, you have a few more things to say about that, plus other, um, other uh, steps that the electric utility is taking to try and manage this so that we can all you know, get more and more um, EV mm -hmm. and solar uh, on our grid. So take it away. Yeah. yeah. No, as far as transportation goes, it <clears throat> presents a really good opportunity to raise that duck's belly, you know, right. make the load curve more you know, without the big dips in it. Um, right. um, that, Part of that is trying to increase the energy that's used during that high solar time in the middle of the day. Right. So if people can get more electric cars, start using them more, and plugging them in during that time, it can certainly help you know, to, re to increase the load and reduce that, you know, the dips in the load curve that can cause problems for the utility to keep their system stable. Um, so are we looking the, at any kind of incentives that will come out to at least help people? I mean, it's tough if you're... Mm -hmm. If you have like a nine to five job and you're in a covered parking lot, and all, what, what can I do about my, you know, my electric vehicle? Um, there's a lot of talk about that. The utility put out an electrification of transportation plan uh, maybe a year or so ago. Yes. And I'm not sure how much it's moved, but I know there's activity in putting in charging infrastructure. Um, workplace charging is a big issue that comes up a lot. Right. Um, it, it does cost for the infrastructure to put in because it's pretty, you know, high voltage and, and high energy that needs to right. go and charge the batteries. But if, if we can charge more EVs in the workplace, all, all the better. I mean, like at University of Hawaii, they're just covering their big parking garage on the lower campus with um, photovoltaic panels. If, yeah. if people could charge cars with, with that, that would you know, help the system out as a whole a lot in you know, right. bringing up that belly of the duck curve. Right. And there's... Um, a lot of things going on. I know Hawaiian Electric and uh, Hawaii Energy, who is our efficiency provider. I know you right. guys have those guys on the yeah, show. Yeah, sure. They're doing a program to help incentivize and, and probably have some kind of rebates and help for multi-unit dwellings to install chargers. Because right. that's a big problem in Hawaii too. A lot of people are in condos or renting, so they probably wouldn't even consider getting an electric car if they can't charge it overnight at home or whatever. Right. But um, those types of things are underway, um, and I, I think just the uptake of EVs. I'm a happy owner of two of them are right you? now, oh, really? and I have PV on my roof, and they are a little more expensive now, and hopefully the cost will come down, but I can tell you the savings, um, not even with rebates or certain places you can park without paying yeah. <laughs> and things like that, but just the, the general maintenance is very low. I had a electric car that I was leasing for three years, and I brought it in twice for regular maintenance. And basically, all they did was rotate tires and fill windshield wiper yeah. fluid. There's no issues with oil and gears and carburetors and all that type of thing. Oil so, filters, right? Yeah, cost me <laughs> so there's, a there's not a lot to fix with the electric motors. Yeah, right. I mean, sometimes the battery cells degrade faster, which is why I leased the first couple of cars yeah. I had. And uh, but. Those issues, I think, are, are being addressed, and I think the prices will come, continue to come down on electric vehicles too, especially as more people yeah. buy them and you know, the economies of scale can 
kick in more. I recently, uh, last week, um, was on the big island, and when I came back to pick up my car and was, I was looking for my car, I couldn't believe how many electric vehicles are parked in the, the airport, airport parking <laughs> structure. It's like rows and rows of them almost, you know? It's like people are like taking the yep. car, driving to the airport. I mean, in a way, it's like not really what the legislation was supposed to be promoting. Yep. But nevertheless, you know, I mean, people are kind of gaming the system in some ways, but I guess we still are working but, for the greater good. But those are incentives that were put in place. And, and, exactly. But, and I'm sure they will be taken away at some point as more and more is adopted. Yeah. And we see more and more in Hawaii every day. You can, right. Driving down the road, you see more and more every day. So yeah. at some point, that will stop. Right. Many people think that's unfair, but those of us with electric vehicles are going to take advantage of them of while course, they're yeah, there. Exactly. And yeah, I, but it's, it's thought that electric vehicles can be part of a solution to some of the renewable intermittency and storage issues sure. because, I mean, they're loaded with batteries. So, I mean, in, in that sense, right now, if you have it on a charger that's smart, they can, you know, sense when is a good time to charge or not. And eventually they're talking about vehicle to grid where they can take energy from your cars. And I know they do in some places in Europe, they have programs. And right. They're testing things in California. But a lot of people I know who own EVs aren't too interested in that at this point just because you're using some of my battery cycles and they might. Yeah. go away sooner than I'd like them to. Yeah, exactly. So, but there are ways to do it with just the charging alone and timing that correctly so that you know, it doesn't hurt the system and can even help it in some instances. Right. So can you tell, talk a little bit about time of use rates and how that might factor into all this? Um, yeah, sure. Um, that, and also uh, demand. Yeah. yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about demand and overall storage. Yeah, I mean, one of the um, new programs that's out there is kind of that smart export where you're not supposed to export during certain times of the day right. but the utility is also looking at i was actually just at a meeting on monday an all-day workshop on rate design where they're looking at various ways to structure rates you know different rates during the daytime to incent certain behaviors and one right. of them would be you know either having storage on your house with your pv or even without it um, and you know when you charge your electric vehicle and things like that the idea is to have a lower rate when all that pv is on the grid and it might make things unstable so that people will use it more and then have a higher rate at that evening peak to incent people to not charge their ev at that time or if they have batteries with coupled with a pv system to use the energy from the batteries then instead of taking it off the grid where they would be charged a higher rate so here's so, the so they're so, trying to use the market to yeah. incent the behavior that will help the grid and help us move forward with our So what if I live in a shaded area, they put up all these like, you know, four hundred foot skyscrapers and all that, and my little house used to have a lot of sun but now has none. I mean conceivably I could just install a battery exactly. and arbitrage, you know, the time of use rate. So I've got my battery there when the when the cost of electricity is low, I can charge it help up. the electric <laughs> utility by using up some of this power and then uh, charge my battery and then when peak power or, you know, use that, um, you know, at night and throughout the day. Exactly. Yeah. With, with the right rate structure, it will incent that type of behavior right. and, you know, help the utility solve some of its problems. I think. Right. One of the things, that, yeah. you know, I've been hoping for, you know, smart, smarter rate design than the utility has had for a long time since right. I was regulating them. And I think things are finally in place. I mean, part of it was they didn't have the, software and stuff to, and the right meters to do all the tracking sure. that they would need to, to charge different rates during different yeah. times of the day. But uh, I think most of that is in place now and they're, they're seriously exploring it with the commission and you know, all the energy stakeholders in town. Okay. So we were going to talk about storage, I think, before yeah. we cut. No, and, and part of that, um, the, the utility there, they're, they've been going out to procure more renewable energy, and the most recent batch is all you know, photovoltaic on a utility scale, you know, several tens of megawatts coupled with battery storage. Right. Like, like you heard on Kauai, they've had a couple of contracts that basically are what they call dispatchable PV. The PV charges the batteries, and then the batteries can be charged as the grid needs it, which oftentimes will be in the evening when the sun isn't out at that peak time. So HECO is also, you know, HECO companies, you know, Helco and MECO as well, had 
just gotten approvals for a whole bunch of those. I think it's about 500 megawatts total. Yeah. And it's pretty cheap. I mean, they're right. down 11 cents or so for kilowatt Well, 108 hour. cents is the lowest. I mean, that's yeah. unbelievable. That includes everything. I yep. mean, the battery, the uh, electrical yeah. installation, all the engineering. Yep. Wow. I mean, that's like really <laughs> If low. there's battery problems, the developer, yeah, that's he's on their, the, he's on their the hook, hook for it. For it. Yeah. Right. So, so that and their, their next step is to do another RFP similar to that. Um, and, and I hear that's coming out pretty soon. Yeah, they, I think they want to get it out as soon as they can. The re, uh, PUC Next is credits. reviewing it to make sure it's kind of asking for things they think are appropriate. So right. With all this PV and storage going in, they've, they've kind of pegged the, the storage requirement with the PV for each megawatt of PV. They wanted a megawatt of storage that could discharge a megawatt for four hours. So we call it four megawatt hours. Um, for each megawatt of PV, so oh, all, really? all of those recently approved systems are batteries at that level. That's a pretty big battery. Yeah, and one of the things we've been looking at at HNEI and just looking at, you know, what this means is having, you know, all of these projects have four hours of storage basically for the energy. It kind of means at this point we're not using those batteries as well as we could. I mean, yeah. if you could also use them for other things like providing some of those reserves in case something trips offline. Right. Um, you could be using them more efficiently and saving money that the utility is otherwise spending to um, you know, provide those services on its own. Right. So we, some of our analyses we've been doing most recently is looking at that. And it does at some point, I mean, when we get enough solar on the grid, we're supposed to get to 100%, and solar is one of the most likely to happen. I mean, there could be a little more wind. Maybe not offshore on wind someday. I, I hear yeah, they've used up much. all the good sites. <laughs> right. but so yeah. It's, yeah. So it looks like it's going to be mostly PV and right. other emerging technologies if other things come along. Sure. So, but we've just been looking, adding PV to see what would happen with the system. And, you know, for a big chunk of it, you don't need all that. I mean, right. not even to shift the energy because there is still room most times on the grid. There's that few times a year where it causes those problems. But, but eventually, as you, put more and more PV on and you start retiring your, your oil or gas fired units, you are going to need that much. So okay. it's kind of a, we kind of have too much now, but we're going to need it in the future. Sure. And it's cheap now, so you might as well grab it while you can. Okay. Well, that's a wrap. <laughs> uh, you know, we run out of time, believe it or not. I mean, these half hours <laughs> go by so fast. So John, thank you so much. Sure. Um, I asked John uh, only yesterday morning if he would come on the show. <laughs> afternoon. And, <laughs> afternoon. Oh, sorry, even less time. So uh, he was very, very accommodating and coming on at such short notice. So thanks so much, John. Oh. And I know now so much more about this <laughs> duck curve oh. than I did when before we started the show. So thank you very much. And so that wraps it up for Hawaii, the state of clean energy. That's Mitch Ewan at Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And we're signing off. And we'll see you next Wednesday. So aloha, <laughs> y'all. Oh, ah, thank you. <laughs>